Dandavat de Mahaji Prabhu. Dandavat. Hare Krishna. Happy Friday. Good to see everybody. There's Somya Sham Prabhu, I think from Ireland. Good morning. Buenos dias. Krishna Chaitanya Das in uh, Ukraine, Slava Ukraini. There's uh, Dayal Gore Das from Abkhazia. They have really good honey in Abkhazia. Vijay Raman uh, had a big jar of honey from Abkhazia. And I had a cold. It was really good. Samya Sham says Hare Krishna, but maybe it's a different Samya Sham because he's Hare Krishna everybody in in Russian. There's a photo of him in, I guess, Lakta. It says Chukotka. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our discussion of uh, the Sri Sri Prapanachivanamritam by His Divine Grace Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami. And we're reading from the the Bhagavad Vachanamritam. Just a moment, please. Two, three. Yeah. We're in chapter nine, if you're following along in your book. Now this is the uh, Sri Sri Bhagavad Bhachanamritam, the words of nectar from the Supreme Lord. And there's a lot of quotations in here from the Bhagavad Gita, as we were saying last week. <laughs> the, the best way of overcoming Maya is through surrender. So we tried to talk about this a little bit last week. Week. The idea of Maya, it's a very deep and profound uh, concept. And I was trying to speak about Maya from the point of view of how this material reality uh, has an illusory quality. Maya actually means not this. And someone pointed out, well, aren't we directed to think about how Maya plays out in terms of our false concept of identity. And uh, that was a nice perception. Uh, it's not possible to simply say, well, this world is an illusion and uh, I just don't believe in it. Uh, that will not work because that's coming from you. And you cannot overcome the illusion simply by by saying, well, I don't believe in it. Uh, Krishna says, you can overcome this illusion only through surrender. So it's by coming to terms with our false conception of identity that we are able to discover through surrender our true identity as servants of the Lord. Krishna says, Daivahiye Shagunamai, Mama Maya Duratyaya, Mam Eva, Ye Prapadyante, Mayam Etan, Tarantite. And then Shiva Sridhar says, Well, what's the point of knowledge, really? What's the point of knowing? Uh, Sri Krishna Prapatir Eva Shuta Jnana Falam. Iti anubhavitur mahatmana sudur labhatvam. He's continuing on the same theme, and he says, the, the true purpose of knowledge is to understand about your true identity and um, discover yourself as a servant of God, a servant of Krishna. Sri Krishna Prapatir, eva shuta jnana phalam. Phalam means fruit. So, Shuddha jnana, pure knowledge. The fruit of pure knowledge is to understand yourself as a servant of, of Krishna. Otherwise, what is the point of so much knowledge? Dandavats, dear devotees. We have a, you can keep up with the 
notes for mother devotees in the in the little chat box down there. Uh, so another verse from the Gita, Bahunam Janmanamante, Gyanavan Man Prapadyate. So this is confirming what Srila Sridhar Maharaj has just told us. Uh, the verse from the Gita says, after many, many births, Bahunam Janmanamante, Gyanavan Man Prapadyate. The, uh, the Gyanavan, those who have transcendental knowledge, they'll surrender to Krishna. Vasudeva Sarvamiti, they know that uh, God is everything, Krishna is everything, Samahatma Sudurlavaha. And this kind of a great soul is very rare. So this is not academic knowledge. This is not knowledge that you can achieve theoretically. <clears throat> it's Shudagyan which means pure knowledge. It's not that by studying a bunch of books or by attending a college uh, seminar on Eastern philosophy, then you will be able to probe the depths of uh, Krishna Bhakti, but only by giving yourself. We had a long, long discussion with uh, Rajasundri and company that... Uh, this word surrender is not very well liked. And uh, her friends, some of her friends in Russia were asking, well, surrender is not a good thing. It means the, here comes the enemy with their guns and their bombs and uh, their atrocities, and they want to kill me. And I throw up my hands and say, I surrender. That's not a good thing. We don't want that. Why would we want surrender? And so I said, well, Another word for this in Sanskrit is sharanagati, which means the path of taking shelter, of taking refuge. If you, <clears throat> in this age, so many people are addicted to so many terrible things, they get involved in a 12 step program. And these different anonymous 12 step programs tell you the first thing you have to do is accept a higher power. So, sharanagati. It means taking shelter of a higher power. And just what that higher power is, how can we understand the nature of that higher power? That's given, that's given more specifically in the Vedas. A very general concept is given in the West, uh, the fatherhood of God. My... My father in heaven, his house has many mansions. And things like that, this very sort of general concept that the great white father in the sky, uh, people can relate to that. But in India, rather than focus so much on how to exploit this world, the great seers of the truth have uh, engaged their intelligence and knowledge in how to unlock the mysteries of the soul, the mysteries of consciousness. And uh, the Vedanti, those who know, Vedanti Tat, Tatva, Vidas Tatvam, who really explored the truth, Yajjana Madhvayam, they say this is a threefold, uh, even in oneness, Brahmeti, Paramatmeti, Bhagavan, Iti, Shabdhyate. And this is called uh, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Brahman meaning some higher force, nothing personal about it, but there must be some greater force than me in the universe. I was talking to a scientist at a talk I gave in Lakhta, Petersburg, uh, in Russia, at Avadut Maharaj's temple. I said, any questions? And the scientist said, yes. I'm always asking the universe, uh, does God exist? Is there a God? And I get nothing. The universe doesn't answer me back. So where does that leave me? And I said, yes, but you're not paying attention. 
the universe is answering you back at every moment. All you have to do is, uh, just for a moment, close your eyes, listen. You'll hear. Om. You'll hear that hum, that divine sound, Om, everywhere. This is an indication, the Vedas say, Om. What does it mean? Yes, a big yes. That reality that you're looking for, it's there. It does exist. So listen, pay attention. You're not really uh, trying to hear what the universe has to say to you. Pay attention. You're distracted. You're distracted by so many things. Uh, sex, money, drugs, power, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, but you're not paying attention. So pay attention. Listen, you'll see. The universe is much bigger than you thought. <laughs> we think there's no God because we look around. And if you look around yourself right now, everything you see uh, is man-made. The wall, the TV set, the computer, the pixels on the computer screen, uh, the books in the library, it's all made by humans, which is an amazing accomplishment if you think about it, because animals have no such context. Uh, the cat doesn't create its universe around it, neither does the dog, but we do. So when you look around in this mad man-made universe of cars and freeways and uh, radio sets and uh, so many modern wonders of technology. You think, well, everything around me was made by man. Why should I believe in it? A higher power, a higher God, force. But the Vedas tell us, Brahme ti Paramatme ti Bhagavan ti Shabdite. Uh, first of all, there's a higher force. You can know that just by listening. Om, a big yes, it's there. Uh, but beyond that, or within that, if you like. I'm everywhere. I'm within. I'm without. The Upanishads tell us. I forgot. God is everywhere. Within the universe, without the universe. He's within you. That's a higher level meditation. And that's also found in the Vedas. But even above that, there's the idea of Bhagavan, the personal God. God as Krishna, Akila Rasamrita Murti, the emporium of all feeling, all rasa, all joy, all happiness. It's all coming from, from God. Know that. That's the purpose of knowledge. That's the purpose of the Vedas. Bakunam Janmanam Ante Gyanava Mam Prapadideo. Really wise man will pursue this kind of knowledge. You can't find out in the university. It's, it's, it's prohibited. You're not allowed to talk about God. If you do, you can be separated from your charge. You know, this person you, you doesn't understand. Education is laic. You know, it's uh, secular. You're not allowed to talk about God. So how could you learn about God? Uh, in an academic setting. That's not possible. So it's nice to listen to my talk. I'm, I'm very academic, I think. I have lots of books. I make reference to them all the time. But uh, the real thing is dive into reality. Surrender. What does surrender mean? You have to find one of these great Mahatmas, Sa Mahatma Siddhurlava, and see, what, you know, how does he know these things? Where did he get this from? How, how can I know this? Seek out uh, the guru. And the, the way that the guru transmits knowledge, it's not exactly like uh, having a notebook and a journal and a pencil and uh, doing homework assignments and projects and all that. No, it means giving yourself giving yourself entirely, sharanagati, taking refuge, surrender. So surrender is a hard nut to crack. One time I was sitting with Srila Sridhar Maharaj, and he was speaking 
like I'm speaking now, general ideas. And one of the devotees said, oh, Hari Bo, Maharaj, Hari Bo. And Srila Sridhar leaned over very gravely with his dry sense of humor. He said, Hari Bo and horrible. The prospect of surrender is such. So it's a horrible thing to give yourself. What happens if you do that? You're putting yourself on the line. You're risking everything. But if you don't risk everything, what do you gain? It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved. So you risk yourself. You put yourself on the line and you discover, oh, you know, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was. This person who I thought was a great Mahatma, maybe he wasn't as great. But uh, the lesson is yours for the learning. We all, have, we all have a different path. You can't walk on my path. It would be impossible. First, you'd have to get in a time machine and go back to 1953. <laughs> you can't do that, you know. I've done so many ridiculous, crazy, stupid things uh, in this life. You wouldn't want to copy that. You have your own path. So, so what happens if you surrender? What does Srila Sridhar say? He says, Love the chits for upasyaiva Sri Krishna parabhakti atasa nirguna eva. He says, a person who has realized his constitutional spiritual nature engages in transcendental devotional service unto the lotus feet of Krishna. So if you, if you take this message to heart, if you, now we've been through 90% of the Prapana Jiva Namrita, if you get the idea, all right, surrender, Surrender to Krishna, that's for me. And you do that, then you'll come to certain spiritual realizations about who you are. And you will come to the lotus feet of Krishna. Therefore, such devotion is transcendental to the three modes of material nature. So I don't want to talk anymore about the modes of material nature. It's an interesting subject. So here's another quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma. Na Shochati Na Kangshati. Samasar Vesha Bhuteshu. Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. So as you enter into this understanding about how God exists, how there's a higher force, how there's a paramatma you can meditate on, how God is personal, how Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Gradually, you achieve self-satisfaction. You become free from lamentation and hankering. Na shochati, na kankshati. Remember that at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is he's He's lamenting. He's overcome with emotion. He doesn't want to ride forth onto the battlefield and uh, make war against his guru, his cousin, his uh, preceptor, his grandfather. He's at a loss. What do I do? And so Krishna's guiding him to a proper balance in his life where he realizes inner peace and becomes free from uh, hankering and desire, lamentation and the rest. So the, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is a message of peace. It's a message of struggle, but it's a spiritual struggle. Some people mistake the, the Gita and think, well, this is a book about war. I remember when I was a young man, I was against the war in Vietnam, and I met the devotees, and I read some of their book and thought, well, doesn't this book promote war, and aren't we agents of peace? Aren't we against war? And they explained to me, no, you don't get it. The Bhagavad Gita is about the internal struggle. 
It's about how we can achieve peace through surrender to God. He says one can achieve self-satisfaction, freedom from lamentation and hankering, and perceive the equality in all beings. Sama sarveshu bhuteshu. And this is important too. It's it's important to see the spiritual quality of all living entities, be they black, white, women, Ukrainian, Russian, Israeli, uh, American, Mexican. Uh, internally, we're Atma. Try to see the Atma and you will see all living beings as uh, samasarveshu bhuteshu. Uh, equal in spirit, mad bhaktim labate param. And that's one achieves uh, bhakti, transcendental devotional service. And uh, so who is Krishna? Akila Rasamrita Murti Sri Krishna Eva. So Krishna is the embodiment of the entire compass of divine mellow. So it's not just the fatherhood of God. It's also the sonhood of God. Ragupati Upadhyaya and the Chaitanya Charitamrita uh, he's asked, what is the meaning of the Vedas? And he says, well, you know, I can't really tell you so much about the meaning of the Vedas because I'm not fascinated by that. But what fascinates me is that the Vedas personified. They want to take birth as a blade of grass in Vrindavan so they can take the foot dust of the gopis on their head. What fascinates me is that the supreme absolute reality is playing as a small child eating mud in the backyard of Nanda Maharaj. So who is this Nanda Maharaj? That fascinates me. He's the father of God. I'm not interested in the fatherhood of God. I'm interested in this Nanda Maharaj because he has... God himself playing in his backyard. What did he do? What kind of austerities did he perform? What sort of uh, divine yoga did he do to get this position where God himself is playing around in his back garden? So, Krishna's the emporium of all rasas. And that's not merely even as the sonhood of Godhead is the son of uh, Nanda and Yashoda. But what about as the lover of, of Srimati Radharani? What is her position? What is the position of these highly developed yogis in female form, the gopis? But we don't talk much about this because it's very confidential and people misunderstand. So Srila Sri Ramar says, Akila Rasamrita Murti Sri Krishna Eva Gani Gana Mrigyaturya Brahmano Mulashraya. Krishna, the embodiment of the entire compass of divine mellows, is the absolute source of the undifferentiated Brahman that the liberationists desire to merge into as the fourth state of the soul. So it's very nice, this idea of a divine force, a divine power, the divine light, om bhur bhuva swa tat savitur varenyam, this sort of divine light that illuminates the universe, illuminates the soul. What is that divine light? But we know this is merely the halo of Krishna. So who is this Krishna? Brahmano hi pratishtaham amritasya vyayasya cha shashvatasya cha dharmasya sukhasya kantikasya cha. Another verse from the Bhagavad Gita. So remember this chapter is Krishna speaking on the nature of bhakti. Krishna is describing what is the point of bhakti? What is the point of surrender? So Krishna says, transcendental to the modes of nature as the axiomatic truth, replete with the divine variegatedness of holy name, form, nature, associates, and pastimes, I alone am the mainstay and fountainhead of Brahman. 
the ultimate destination of liberationists and Ghanis, immortality, immutability, eternality, the eternal substance of divine love and the ultimate ecstasy of the, the divine mellows of Vrindavan, all these are supported by me, the transcendental variegated axiomatic reality, Krishna. Ah, that's a very nice translation. It's interesting that the uh, Sanskrit of the Bhagavad Gita is really very simple Sanskrit. It's uh, often criticized by Sanskrit scholars who say, well, this could not be spoken by God himself because obviously God has greater poetic powers than the author of the Bhagavad Gita. You look at <clears throat> the... Uh, the Megdut of uh, the poet Kalidas, or uh, uh, Shakuntala by Kalidas. You look at the great Sanskrit poets, uh, and you'll see, wow, what power of metaphor, what a turn of phrase, uh, how delightfully the music of their uh, syllables play out. And then you turn to the Bhagavad Gita and okay, it's simple. So Sanskrit teachers and scholars always give you the Bhagavad Gita <clears throat> as first year of Sanskrit. And they'll save Kalidas for maybe the fifth year because it's so much more <clears throat> poetic, filled with alankara, ornamentation, and so on. So one may ask, well, why is it that Krishna is putting these things in such simple language? And the answer is to make it easy for us to understand, because we're so thick-headed. It would be, why make it more obscure? Why, would, why make these descriptions and expressions about divinity more difficult to understand? So sometimes the translators that want to try to help Krishna out by using a more esteemed lexicon and vocabulary. Uh, but it's not always so necessary. Krishna's language really speaks for itself. Brahmano he pratishtaha. <clears throat> He's talking about Brahma, uh, this higher force, the divine power, the divine light. So you can write uh, thousands of lines describing what is the nature of Brahman and then use that as your translation and so the translator has the mainstay and fountainhead of Brahman the ultimate destination of liberationists it's very nice <clears throat> <clears throat> but Krishna just says, I established that, pratishta hum. You've heard this word pratishta. Pratishta means to be established. It means name and fame. Huh? We're, we're told to guard against kanak, kamini, and pratishta, gold, girls, and name and fame. Kanak means money. Kamini means sex, like the Kama Sutra, desire, Kamini. So how do you translate Kama or Kamini? Well, for for women, you would not say girls necessarily. You, you might want to say men. And for men, you want to say women. So Kamini is also difficult to translate, but we got it, sex. Pratishta. What is Pratishta? It means fame, uh, prestige, having millions of followers on Facebook and Instagram, uh, being a rich and powerful dictator of a populous country. But it also means to establish. So, Brahmani, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. I establish Brahman. 
that force that you're praying to in your 12-step program, I created that. I'm I'm the founder. Brahmano hi pratishta Amritas Amritas Yavyasya Cha. And there's that word Amrita again that we've discussed so often because it's the title of this book, Prabhana Jivan Amrita. Amrita. It means immortal, but it also means divine nectar. So scholars and translators, they try to go after the meaning of Amrita from the physical point of view, because in the West we're we're obsessed with technology. So they want to say, well, what is this Amrita? What is this Soma that uh, so often discussed? Maybe magic mushrooms or some kind of brew of ayahuasca and uh, peyote, magic mushrooms that uh, in the old Vedic age, they used to drink that and summon up the gods. But this is a very materialistic view. Amritasya means deathlessness. But Sri the Sri Ramashi likes positive and progressive immortality because when you say death, deathlessness, you're really defining um, spirituality by talking about the opposite of death. And what is death? We don't really know. What is dead? Inertia. Something dead is inert, inert matter, inertia. But it, Deathlessness would be the opposite of inertia. So, un-inertia, amrita. It's a difficult thing to define. So, Srila Sridhar is pointing out, no, immortal life means that the soul has a life after this one. There is an afterlife. What is the nature of that afterlife in service to Krishna? It must be positive. It must be progressive. It's not simply floating uh, in an ocean of light. It's a happy metaphor to float in an ocean of light. But even happier is uh, Vrindavan. So Krishna's saying, this is what I, this is what you're getting with surrender. You're getting a happy life. Sukasyaiva su Sukasya kantikasya cha, a life that's full of happiness. Immortality, immutability, eternality, the eternal sustenance of divine love. So this is his attempt to define amrita. Krishna uses the word amrita. And the ultimate ecstasy of the divine mellows of Vrindavan, Raja Rasa, all these are supported by me the transcendental, variegated, axiomatic reality, Krishna. This is his translation. Brahmano hi pratishtaham amritas yavyayasya cha shashvatasya cha dharmasya sukhaisya kantikasya cha. So, while on one level the Sanskrit and the Gita appears to be simple, uh, it's pregnant with meaning. It's very uh, packed full of meaning. And in this translation, Srila Sridhar is unpacking uh, the meaning of the Gita a little bit. And for further information on this, you can read uh, The Hidden Treasure of the Sweet Absolute, which is uh, Srila Sridhar Marsh's uh, <clears throat> Bhagavad Gita. So then uh, Sri the Sri Ramarsh continues, O Panishat Purushasya, Sri Krishna, Krishna's Yaiva Yogi Janam Rigyam Nikila Chid Achin Niantrit Vam. And you know, it's curious if you go through um, many things that are attributed to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, uh, written in English. If you look at them very closely, uh, you'll see that they mirror the style and lexicon uh, 
of uh, Nishikant Sanya. Nishikant Sanya was uh, the, also known as the professor. So much so that you have to think maybe that this Nishikant Sanya was the translator for Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. But the only other person who speaks like that is Srila Sri And so you have to think, well, perhaps some of those things that are attributed to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, they're really flowing from uh, Srila Sri Dharmaj. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur himself, he said, I'm confident that when I go, there's at least one man here, Srila Sri Dharmaj, who can represent my point of view. So if you listen to how this is framed, it sounds a lot like Bhakti Siddhanta. Uh, this is another verse from the Gita. Oh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing the, the sutra. The sutra by Sri Dharma says, encompassing the aggregate individuality and collectivity, the absolute autocracy over both the material and spiritual planes is held by Sri Krishna alone. The supreme male dominating principle as corroborated in the Upanishads, and he is the objective sought after by the yogis. So, then he gives us this verse from the Gita, Sarvasya chaham ridisani vishto matas mitir gyanam apohanam cha vedaishta sarvairaham eva vedyo vedanta krit vedavit eva chaham. So we were talking about the Vedas. What is the meaning? Who gave the Vedas? Well, Krishna says here, I gave the Vedas. <clears throat> I'm the Vedanta Krit. I made the Vedas. I made the Vedanta. I'm the sum total of the Vedas. I'm the end of the Vedanta. I know the Vedas. I am situated as the Supreme Lord within the hearts of all souls. As a result of a soul's worldly deeds, his remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness arise from me alone. Thus, I am not only Brahman, the absolute spirit that pervades the universe, but above that, I am the super soul present in the hearts of the living beings who dispenses the results of their attempts. And even above my worshipable aspects of Brahman and Paramatma, I am the guru of all souls, the eternal dispenser of their good fortune. I am Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, to be known by all the Vedas. I am the creator and perfect knower of all the axiomatic conclusions of the Vedas, the Vedanta. And it's also interesting, no one else makes this claim. You can go through the Puranas and the Upanishads, <clears throat> and you'll find places where Shiva, perhaps, identifies as the spiritual force, the divine power. But you'll never find such categorical declarations that uh, I am the absolute source of all divinity, as you find in the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. So if you take Krishna at his word, then you must take his message seriously. You can suspend your disbelief and say, well, okay, I'm just going to check this out and see if it's really true. Uh, is Maybe Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. So I'm going to take to this process of uh, chanting Hare Krishna and taking the holy name of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare, Hare, and see if it transforms my life. And you'll find that it does. So, Srila Srinivas continues, Tad Vishnu Paramam Param Evagantavyam Tachchaganinam Anavriti karakam yoginam arichaitanya swarupam karminam cha karmapala vidhayakam. He says, so the desire, if this is true, 
take it as true, then the desired goal must be the supreme divine lotus feet of Lord Vishnu, who is the ordainer of ultimate emancipation for the liberationists, jnanis, the supreme lord of the meditationists, yogis, and the rewarder of the elevationists, karmis. So everything that you want, either as seeker of truth, as uh, a productive, creative person looking to better yourself in your next life through your karma, or as a yogi, all that you might want is available from Krishna. So, uh, again, from the Bhagavad Gita, tatapadam tat parimar gita vyam yasmin gita na nivar tanti buya tam eva chadyam purusham prapadye yata pravriti prasrita purani. Thus, one should search out that supreme goal of no return. Tata Padam, that domain. Try for that higher domain. This is our ideal. The lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. I surrender unto him, the original person from whom the perpetual material world has extended. Wow. Avidya Nirmukta Sampurna Gya Eva. Lila Purushotimam Shri Krishna Eva Nikila Bhavaira Bhajate. So Shri Sridhar he's continuing his argument in these sutras. He says, Those liberated from ignorance and endowed with full-fledged knowledge render service in all devotional mellows headed by consort who had Madhura Rasa unto Sri Krishna, the Supreme Lord, hero, divine pastimes, Lila Purushottama. Now, this is not just a bald statement. We have all this corroborating evidence, which is the rest of the book. He, he just spent eight chapters describing all the different devotees from uh, the followers of Ram and Ayodhya, the followers of Krishna and Vrindavan, uh, present-day, more modern devotees from the time of Jamunacharya, Ramanujacharya, uh, King Kula Shekhar, the Alwars of South India, up to the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and including Madhvacharya, Ramanuj, and later the six Goswamis, uh, Prabodhananda Saraswati. He's described all, and the, then there's the Puranas, all these different uh, kinds of devotees in his uh, the uh, Bhakta Vachanamrita. What, what the Bhaktas had to say. So he's already documented this. Hmm? He says, those liberated from ignorance and endowed with full-fledged knowledge, meaning all these great souls from uh, the Lord Maharaj uh, on down, They render service in all devotional mellows headed by consorthood. So it's documented. This is not something that Srila Sridhar made up. It's not something that Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Thakur uh, invented or Bhakti Vinod. They didn't invent this. It's an ancient uh, tradition of bhakti extending back thousands of years. And some people say, well, okay, you know, maybe the Bhagavad itself, the Bhagavad Purana, perhaps, uh, even Bhakti Vinod Thakur in uh, the Sri Krishna Sanghita, he'll say something like, well, historically, it may be found by some scholars, the uh, Bhagavatam might have been written in the ninth century, the 10th century, uh, who knows? But that's on this planet, in this age. We know that uh, the four different yugas, they repeat themselves. Uh, Satya, Treta, Dwapara, Kali. They repeat themselves again and again in different 
ages, and different kalpas, and different planetary systems, that this particular treatise of divine knowledge was manifested at a particular age or date in time it doesn't really mean anything. It's not. We're not interested in historicity. We're not interested in proving historically uh, who, what, when, where, why the Bhagavatam was written. We're interested in the truths contained therein. If uh, somebody discovers uh, penicillin, if they discover that penicillin kills germs, that's a useful discovery. It doesn't matter when it came into existence. If that was discovered in the 19th century, or if the Chinese had some version of that 6,000 years ago that they prepared with bread mold, we don't know. It's not important exactly when that particular discovery came to light. Truth is truth. Facts are facts whenever they're discovered or revealed. So uh, this kind of revealed knowledge, Sri Ramesh is giving it to you. He's saying, look, throughout the ages, uh, this is a known factor. Those who are liberated from ignorance, avidya nir mukta sampurna ga eva lila purushotanam shri krishnam eva nikila bhavair bhajate. Those liberated from ignorance and endowed with full fledged knowledge render service. Those who realize the nature of true divinity, uh, they don't scoff at that and say, oh, well, you know, I have important things to do today. Uh, I'll look into that next week. No, they render service. And uh, so the verse from the Gita, Yo mam eva masamuto, janati purushottamam, sasarva vid bhajati mam, sarva bhavena bharata. So bharat. And when Krishna calls Arjuna Bharat, he does so for a reason. Uh, the name for India is Bharat. It's on the rupee. It says Bharat. The name for the, the great history of old India is called the Mahabharat. So when Krishna turns to Arjuna, he says, look, Bharat. <laughs> He's saying, look, you know, this is your heritage. You know this. You go back to the ancient king Bharat, established India. You remember this. This is important. One who is liberated from illusion and thus knows me alone as the supreme personality, such a full-fledged servant, savant, I'm sorry, serves me in all respects. Savant, savant, that's a good word. Sarva bhavena Bharat. So sarva vit, bhajatima, sarva vit, one who knows everything, sarva vit, savant, a knower. And Srila Sri Ramash continues his, his argument with another sutra. Karma jnana dhyana yoginam api, tat tad bhavam chakva, ye machit shakti gata shradhamashritat, Ajante ta eva sarva shreshta. He says, of all the yogis who follow the paths based on action, knowledge, and meditation, the topmost are those who abandon their respective attitudes in order to take refuge in their heart's faith in my personal potency. So he's saying, whether you're a karma, karmi, jnani, yogi, if you give that up for bhakti, then those are the highest. And then the verse from the Gita, you probably know this verse, obviously, because he's describing the Maha Yogis. <laughs> Yogina Mapisarvesham, Madgatenantaratmana, Shradavan Bajate Yomam, Same Yuktatamo Mataha. It's in my opinion. Of all types of yogis, the most elevated of all is he who surrenders his heart to me and serves me in devotion with sincere internal faith. So that's the meaning of, of, of the Maha Yoga. 
just yoga, the word yoga, it's kind of a general word. It kind of just means practice. So to be a yogi, it means to be a practitioner. So what's your practice? Are you practicing money, 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 money? Are you practicing sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Are you practicing, wow, I, I want to have a nice tight butt and, you know, fit into a, a new bikini for the summer. That's my yoga. Well, you know, Krishna's saying, whatever your yoga is, uh, if it's directed to me, that will take you higher. And you want to go higher. Yogi Sarvesham Madgatenantaratmara. Shradavan Bhajate Yoma. Shradavan, it means have faith, Bhajate, worship me. Not just worship, but engage your life in service to me. Same Yuktatamo Mataha. This is this is the highest. This is this is the greatest kind of yoga. In my opinion, of all types of yogis, the most elevated of all is he who surrenders his heart to me and serves me in devotion with sincere internal faith. <clears throat> so Srila Sri Ramaraj continues his argument. Nira varchina prema bhakti jajino mat parshada eva parama shreshta. Mat parshada becomes my associate. Another verse from the Gita. Maya, maya aveshya mano yemam nitya yukta apasate shradhaya parayopetas teme yukta tama mataha. Says, my associates who serve me in uninterrupted loving devotion are the most superior. <clears throat> Parama shreshta. So we're not saying that you can't worship ghosts. We're not saying that you can't worship a rock or the forest or a mountain or your forefathers uh, and ancestors. We're not saying uh, that you can't be a, a, a Muslim or a Christian or a Buddhist. We're not against anyone in that sense. We're not tr going to deride any other point of view or faith. Uh, but what we're saying is that the Krishna conception is the best. It's the highest. It's the sweetest. Uh, somewhere in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I think, the gradation of sugar is given. I can't remember if it's Kaviraj Goswami or, or Prabhupada, but I think it's Kaviraj Goswami. He's talking about sweetness. So there's sugar cane, and sugar cane is really sweet. But then there's molasses, which is refined. And uh, they make a kind of candy with that uh, that they use to sweeten tea in Mexico and Colombia. It's called piloncillo. It's very nice. But it's not as nice. Uh, in terms of real sweetness, as granulated sugar. And granulated sugar is not as sweet as rock candy. I know I lost my teeth to rock candy. I used to love rock candy when I was about nine or 10 years old. It's really delightful. Not good for you. It'll give you diabetes. Don't do it. But... That sort of gradation of sweetness is given from raw cane to molasses to piloncillo to refined sugar to rock candy. So what we're saying is Krishna consciousness is the rock candy of theism. <clears throat> if religion is the opium of the, of the masses, then Krishna consciousness is the fentanyl. <clears throat> so another verse from the Gita says, Maya Vesha Mano Yema Nitya Yukta Upasate. Yukta, this word yukta, it means engaged. In English, we have the word yoke, like when you put 
two oxen together to plow a field. There's a wooden thing that you hitch them together with. It's called a yoke. That comes from the Sanskrit, yukta. It means to busy oneself, to be involved, to engage, to be hooked up, to be yoked. Oftentimes you hear the word yoga. It means to yoke up with God. Like that. Nitya, nitya means eternal. So nitya yukta upasate. Eternal or always, to always be involved. Dedicating his whole life to me in devotional service with unalloyed faith. One who absorbs his heart in me is definitely the highest of all devotees. Srila hmm? Sridhar says, Krishna's pointing out here, my associates who serve me in uninterrupted loving devotion are the most superior. So the, the news here is if you're involved in devotional service, try to keep it going. Try to make it continuous. Try to make it uninterrupted. Serve Krishna. Ser try to serve God with body, mind, and soul uh, day and night. And I think that's that's good for today. I think we're good. So I'm trying to trying to finish the uh, ninth chapter here. There's only a few more verses left, but I was told by Marty Sudanamaras, don't go too fast. Take your time and relish the nectar or nectar the relish. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, I'm going to say adios here. If, if it, does anyone have any questions or corrections from Shubal and Govinda land to everyone? I've got some comments here. I haven't really looked at that. It, I can't speak and at the same time do the comments. Oh, we have we have here Dundavats. Dear devotees, you may help Bhakti. <clears throat> Dear devotees, you may help the Bhakti online channel to pay for the Zoom account. We need it now. In 2023, I paid for this account by myself. And sometimes with this is uh coming from Soumya Shah. And sometimes with the help of Lilavati Didi from Haifa, Haifa, Israel. Well, thank you so much, Soumya Shah. Let's have a big round of applause. I didn't know that uh, he had helped. So try to keep the Bhakti online channel free. Um, we're not asking for donations from people. We don't ask for money for temple construction or books or anything like that. Uh, I don't make any money off this uh, uh, broadcast, podcast. In 2023, Sami Sham says, I paid for this account, but now there's a war in Israel and my mom had a stroke in December. Oh, we're so sorry. Take good care of your mommy. I have financial problems and cannot do it. Ask for your help. You can help by transferring a small donation, even $1 to PayPal. Check, uh, stay in contact with Vandaris. And then we've got a... We've got a note from Marie Ugaric. And she has a... Oh, she put up the a link to the Gita. You can download it there and read the book. And there's a question here about Gana Shunya Bhakti from this shloka. Some people, this is from the, the book we're reading, I guess. Some consider Sharanagati to be that God consciousness, which is realization of the one non-differentiated nature in all beings and objects by seeing the Supreme Lord as the indwelling super soul of everything. However, such a conception falls within the category of calculative devotion. 
jnana bhakti. It's not in the line of unadulterated pure devotion, shuddha bhakti. Two points are, when you receive so, such type of vision knowledge that the Supreme Lord is the indwelling super soul of everything through Guru Parampara, it's not knowledge, it's revealed truth, right? So, who's this? This is from S.G. Shubhal Govindalat. It's, it's revealed truth, right? And what is Shuddha Bhakti vision in this case? Faith. Well, any, any vision, in my opinion, you know, which is considered, oh, here we go, there's someone, Aloka Nanda says, hello, hi, I know you. Uh, it, it's not from uh, Samisham, this is from Vrajasundri. Okay. Any sort of vision that is informing you with a truth about the divine reality, that's revealed. But revealed knowledge is not the same as love. Oh, okay. Here's some more on, on the PayPal thing. But... Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm thinking about this question, difference between jnana bhakti and shuddha bhakti. Shuddha bhakti is about divine love. It means I may not understand what I'm doing, but I'm doing it out of love and reciprocation will come to me. Uh, dear friend of mine passed away, I think in this month, uh, Chidananda Prabhu, who later became Siddhanti Maharaj. And Siddhanti Maharaj met <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada once he was walking down the street. And uh, when I say Srila Prabhupada, it's Bhaktivedanta Swami. Uh, his car had broken down and the devotees were out with the hood up trying to fix the car and Chidananda knew how to do that. So he walked over and fixed his car. So here he is offering a very important service to my divine preceptor, the Jagat Guru, uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And he didn't know what he was doing. He's just fixing the car. But that's an example of sort of spontaneous devotional service. Didn't have anything to do. He wasn't thinking, well, if I do this, I will get knowledge. If I do this, I will be promoted. No, he was just spontaneously offering some service. So there's many examples in the Puranas of devotees offering some spontaneous service out of love. And they're not calculating the principle. They're not thinking, well, if I do this, I'll get that. <clears throat> uh, bhakti, which is mishra, or uh, mixed with something, it means you're calculating. You're trying to get something back. But real devotion is free from any sort of calculation like that. So jnana shunya bhakti means there's no... There's no particular interest in liberation. Uh, karma shunya bhakti means there's no particular interest in promotion. Jnana mishra bhakti means that you're doing bhakti, but you're hoping that you'll get liberation out of it. You're thinking, well, if I go to the temple and I offer these incense sticks and I follow the rules and regulations, then in my next life I'll get mukti. That's kind of an example of uh, Jnana Mishra Bhakti. If, on the other hand, you realize uh, God, you have a vision of God, uh, that's a kind of divine knowledge, but it's being revealed to you. Narada Muni had uh, such a vision before he was uh, sort of confirmed 
in his bhakti lifetimes later, just by associating with devotees. So, let's see if I got that question. When you receive such type of vision knowledge that the Supreme Lord is the indwelling supersoul of everything, through Guru Parampara, it's not knowledge, it's revealed truth, right? Yeah, kind of. The Guru will tell you that. Try to see things like this. And sometimes you can. If the Guru says, try to see everyone as a spirit soul, and then you, you force yourself. This is my mother-in-law. She's a difficult person. But I'm going to look into her heart, and I'm going to see the super soul. Uh, 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 I'm trying. I can't. Oh, wait a minute. There it is. Maybe that's revealed, you know. Maybe that's practice. What's the difference between sadhana bhakti or, you know, practiced bhakti and, you know, raga bhakti, which is spontaneous, you know? Well, think of music when you practice something. Uh, later on, when you try to execute a, a difficult passage, you can do it without thinking about it. That's kind of the idea. So, yeah, I would say revealed through the parampara, through the guru, by listening. I don't know. Is Brajasundri still on here? That's my attempt at an answer. And uh, again, it says, you know, help out the Help out the channel. Try to keep this channel alive. Uh, as devotees, we're so few and we're scattered all around the planet. It's nice to have some sort of a online virtual sangha. This does me a lot of good. It helps me a lot. I'm happy to see Nayanananda, Brajasundri, and Dial Gore. Dial Gore, Danaka, Shubhal Govinda, as always, Marie Ugoric. The other day I was doing I was trying to do some drawing, but off the computer screen, and I saw your thing and I thought, oh, you know, I, I have insomnia all the time. It's, it's a strange thing. I overthink. You can see by my talk that uh, I think too much. So sometimes at night, it's hard to stop. About four o'clock in the morning, I'm thinking about, well, what will I say? My my talk today was going to be about Dharma. I was going to talk a lot about Dharma. But then I thought, mm, I'll just read the book. So I saw your little note, and I answered that, and then I rested my drawing board on the keyboard, and I guess it started spitting out zeros and ones and things like that. But we're happy we amused you. And uh, Priyanana, as always, good to see you, and thank you for the translation. Anansha Shesh in Espanya. Haribo. Hare Krishna. It looks like he's driving. You're always driving during the Siempre, siempre Vas Manejando. Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. Well, that's it for everybody today. And uh, Gora Premanandi Hari Hari Bo. Uh, Bhaktivrinda Kijai, everybody Kijai, bye bye.